We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable, inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are the guiding principles of our nation. The founding documents and the mission statement for this great nation that we live in. And it truly is a great nation. For 244 years, these are the words we sought to live by. To guide our laws and our practices. And while we haven't always lived up to them, we've always strived to. We've always attempted to grow, to mature, and to be better. And again, as Pastor Darrell said, we may not be a perfect nation, but there's no other place in all the world that I would rather live than here in America. This is truly a great nation. But as great as our nation is, it has always faced threats. Some of those threats have been from without, and some of those threats have been from within. And I believe that today, in this generation that we live in, we face many threats right here and now. And many of those threats that we see splash across the news, talked about over by the water coolers at work, cause many people to live in fear and anxiety and worry. Worry about the future and what it may hold. Worry about their families and their finances, their health. And so today in our time together, I would like to offer you hope, encouragement, and perhaps a renewed perspective, a godly perspective on what we find ourselves facing today. And I want you to know that as, as crazy and as dark and as uncertain as things may seem at times, listen, God has seen all this. He knows what's going on. And He's just as much in control today as He's ever been. And as long as we place our faith in Him and keep our eyes on Him, then we'll be right in the center of His will for our life. Because He has put us here for such a time as this. I hope that you'll join with me as we look in the second chapter of the book of Daniel. And in this chapter of God's Word, we're going to see that Daniel faced many uncertain times of his own. We're going to see that he and faith at times, impossible situations, but because he kept his perspective on God and stayed faithful to what he knew to be true, God gave him a peace and a certainty that surpasses all understanding. Beginning in Daniel chapter 2, what we are going to see is that King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has been reigning for about two years at this point. Most historians tell us that in this uh, time period of Nebuchadnezzar, as he is beginning to establish his kingdom and his reign and rule in Babylon, there were many uncertainties that were surrounding him. There was civil unrest. There were plots to assassinate him and get him off the throne and, and to usurp him. And so as king of Babylon, he was faced with many uncertainties, many doubts, many things that kept him up at night. As it's been said, uneasy rests the head uh, on which the crown sits. And that was especially true of Nebuchadnezzar. And we see, beginning in the first few verses here in chapter 2 of Daniel, that Nebuchadnezzar had a series of nights where he is trying to get some rest. But time and time again, his rest is disturbed by these dreams. Over and over and over again, these disturbing dreams have come to him. It was the, the dream of this colossal statue that was before him of all different types of metal. And then out of nowhere, a rock hits the statue and shatters it into a thousand pieces. And then this rock grows into be a mountain. Not knowing what the dream was, but knowing that it was significant, he assembled all of his counselors, all of his wise men, all of his astrologers and dream interpreters. And he begins to tell them that he's been having a dream that has kept him up night after night after night. And he says that he wants them to interpret the dream, but before he tells them what the dream is and asks for the interpretation, he wants to make sure that what he hears from them is the truth. 
Because during this time, there were many people who were probably trying to feed lies to him or, or uh, tickle his ear with things that he wanted to hear. And so he wanted to ensure the, the interpretation that he received was, in fact, the truth. And so he, he gave them a test, and he said, before you give me your interpretation of what you think this dream means, I want you to tell me what the dream was. I want you to tell me what it is that I've been dreaming over these past few nights, and then once I know that you truly know what you're talking about, then I'll listen to your interpretations. All the scholars and the astrologers and the wise men of Babylon, I imagine, had confused expressions on their faces. They tried to explain to the king that this is not the way things are done. You need to tell us the dream, and then we'll tell you the interpretation. But the king was adamant. You tell me the dream as well as the interpretation. All those men tell, told him that this was an impossible feat, that no one in all the world could do such a thing as this. And so seeing them for liars, frauds, and con men, he ordered them all to be executed. The guards and executioners uh, uh, throw them in jail and go about rounding up all the other wise men and, and astrologers of the, of the day to carry out the king's orders. And that's where we pick up in the book of Daniel as the message finally reaches the ears of this young Jewish man in exile. And he hears the fate that is before him. And we pick up in verse 17, and this is what God's Word tells us of Daniel's response to this particular impossible situation. It says, Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, to Mishael, and to Azariah, you know them of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their Babylonian names. And it says that they might seek mercies from God, from the God of heaven, concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Here what we see is Daniel hears of this impossible situation that in le if he wants to save his life as well as the life of his friends, he has to do the impossible. He has to tell what the king's dream was as well as what the interpretation is. Something that no one could do. But instead of stressing out about it, instead of worrying about it, instead of trying to concoct some scheme, he does what any godly person ought to do. The very first thing that comes to his mind is I'm going to pray. I'm going to go to my God and I'm going to ask him to intervene on my behalf. Not only does Daniel pray, but he gathers around him people that he knows are prayer warriors as well. He gathers around Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he brings them around. He tells them the news and says, listen, we have to go before God and let him intervene on our behalf. As I wonder, as, as I read this passage about Daniel and his companions and their initial reaction to pray, I wonder... Where were the other Jewish men of that day? It wasn't just Daniel and his friends that were taken into exile. All the royal court of Israel at that time was led into exile. All the, the nobles of Israel were taken into exile. They were trained in the Babylonian courts. And undoubtedly, many of them were also considered wise men who would have answered to the king's call. But the only ones that we see in God's word that had the inclination and the thought to pray about their situation was Daniel and his friends. I wonder, I wonder how many people today facing the impossible situation of our nation and our world feel the burden to go before God. And not just pray like we pray over our meals or we pray before bedtime that we'd all stay safe until the morning, but truly with broken hearts for our nation and what the world is going through, come before the, the God who can control all things and can bring our nation back to the place where it needs to be, how many of us are praying? God tells us in his word, you have not because you ask not. And I think, am I asking? Are you asking? I think about our 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 nation and our, 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 the, the state that we're in, and I wonder, what happened to prayer? We no longer pray in our government buildings, although we used to. We never pray in our schools, although we used to. We don't pray in our homes, 
And in many places across our nation, we don't even pray in our churches. Listen, I want you to hear this very carefully. God will never force Himself on a people who don't want Him. Are we seeking after God? Do we want Him with every fiber of our being? Do we see Him as truly the only answer to the problems that we're facing in our world today? If so, the most important thing you can do on any given day is to stand before the King of kings and Lord of lords and lay out all your hurts, all your problems, all your concerns, and all your frustrations before Him. And yet, our days are crowded out with inconsequential things, insignificant things. And we look around and we wonder why the world is going in the direction it's going in. I I suspect that maybe, just maybe, it could be because we, the people of God, have forgotten the power of godly prayer. We need to be people of prayer. The first century church was known as a people of prayer, and they turned the Roman world upside down because they went to a God who was in control of it all. As we look at this powerful moment in Daniel's life, I want you to take a look real quick at verse 19, and notice what it says here. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a nightly vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven, Daniel answered and said this, after God had revealed this answer to his prayer, this is what Daniel says to God, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demands." What Daniel just experienced here and what he just communicated here in this prayer, this praise to God, is what I believe to be one of the most powerful portions in this entire chapter. Not only in this entire chapter, but maybe in all the book of Daniel. Because here we get a summary, a synopsis of what God is trying to communicate, I believe, through the book of Daniel. That God is sovereign over all mankind. That he is in control, and even though we look around and we don't see his hands moving, does not mean that he's not still moving and working in the world today. He says he uh, raises up kings and he brings kings down. He reveals knowledge and he also conceals knowledge from the prideful and the conceited. Daniel acknowledges a truth that each and every one of us need to hear today. That as we look around, and some of us, even sitting here today, we feel uh, anxiety and worry and fear over what we're experiencing as a nation and as a world. But know this truth, the truth that Daniel just communicated in that prayer to God. That the world is shaped by God's providence and godly prayer. That if you want to know what moves the world and shapes the world, it's not politicians and politics, it's not power and finances, it's not military armies or anything else. It's God's providence, and it's godly godly prayer. You look throughout Scripture, and it was godly prayer that allowed Moses, as he was leading the nation of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea to the Promised Land. You look throughout Scripture, and you see that it was prayer that, uh, that allowed David to rise up as the new king of Israel and lead them into the golden era of Israel. It was prayer that allowed Elijah to call down fire from heaven and to destroy the prophets of Baal. It was prayer that allowed the first century church to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. It's prayer that shapes our world. And God, who's bigger than COVID, bigger than lockdowns, bigger, uh, bigger than riots and protests, bigger than anything and everything in heaven and on earth and under the earth, my God and your God, if you trust in Jesus Christ, this is the God who is shaping the world today and he moves on behalf of his children who call on his name and seek his face. Don't wait for the world outside these church walls to call on God. It begins when his people 
who are called by his name, call out, confess their own sins, and seek his face above everything else. Do you want to see revival in this land? Do you want to see God's hand move as only God can? It begins in prayer as we seek him. That's where it started with Daniel. That's where it started in every nation that has ever experienced the mighty hand of God working and moving in their life. And so that's what we see here as Daniel continues on. I want you to notice as he comes before the king and he tells him, I now know what your dream is and I know the interpretation. He tells him of of his dream of this colossal statue that has a head of gold, arms of silver, a a midsection of bronze, and iron feet that go down into uh, a clay mixed with iron. And he says, here's what the dream means. And notice what he says here in verse 36. He says, this is the dream. Now we will tell the king and interpret uh, and the interpretation uh, of it before the king. You, O king, are king of kings, and the God of heaven has given you the kingdom. Notice the providence of God there. Power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the heavens are, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are, the, are this head of gold. But after you will rise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. And then a, a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, and as much as iron breaks to pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes that kingdom will break into pieces and crush all others. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, and the king, uh, that king, kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly uh, strong and partly fragile. And as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle uh, with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now notice this next line. If you highlight or underline your Bible, I would I'd encourage you to note this next phrase. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break to pieces and consume all kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw the stone that uh, cut out of the mountain without hands, and it, was, it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will, pa- uh, what will come pa- to pass after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. Now, what in the world is Daniel talking about? He said Nebuchadnezzar was the the head of the statue, which was gold. But what about the rest of it? Well, here's what Daniel was saying. Scholars will debate this over and over again, and they'll debate which, uh, trying to identify which kingdom is which. But here's the important thing that so often we neglect as we try to dig down into the details. Here's what Daniel was trying to communicate to Nebuchadnezzar. Your king, Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom is going to be phenomenal. It's taken over the world, and it is a beautiful creation. But one day it's going to come to an end. There's going to come a day where your kingdom falls and another one rises. And it won't be as great as yours, Nebuchadnezzar, but it will be great in its own right. But even that kingdom will fall as well. And there will be another one after that, and then another one after that. There will always be kingdoms rising and falling because everything in this life made with human hands is temporary and it's fleeting. As as Solomon says, it's chasing after wind or vapor. You reach for it, it looks solid, but as soon as you try to lay hold of it, it slips through your fingers. But then Daniel says that rock, That rock that was not hewn by human hands that falls from the heavens and hits the statue and shatters all the human kingdoms that are to follow after you. And then this small little rock then becomes a great mountain that takes over the world is a kingdom from heaven that will come and destroy all other earthly human kingdoms and will stay forever and ever and ever. That rock is Jesus Christ. What Daniel 
Saul from a distance and told Nebuchadnezzar, we look back on as happening over 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ came to this earth, shed his blood for you and for me, and established God's kingdom here on this earth. And that kingdom was unexpected. It, it, it started small. No one saw it coming. But when it was established, it has now grown and grown. And it has taken over the world. It is spreading throughout all nations, tribes, tongues. And one day we will see the fruit of that nation because it will never go away. It will be here forever and ever and ever. And here's what we need to understand. That should give each and every one of us hope. That God is moving and orchestrating and, and bringing everything into the picture of what He has planned from beginning. That He is using every moment and every generation, every government and every person to steer the course of human history to the beautiful plan of redemption that is founded in Jesus Christ. I don't care how hopeless it gets. I don't care how uh, scared you may become at, at times. Listen, that only happens when we take our eyes off of Christ. Realize even in moments like we're facing today with pandemics, with civil unrest and riotings, with, with confusion and chaos all around, God is still moving all things and using all things for His glory and for your good. That should give us hope. That should give us peace even in uncertain times. And we should take a, a page out of Daniel's playbook and realize that in moments where we seem to be facing impossible situations, we can remember, just like Daniel did, that the world is shaped by God's providence and by godly prayer. Now, I want to just encourage you for just a moment. I want this to be incredibly practical. And so for those of y'all uh, who are worried and frustrated and concerned and, and, and doubtful, I want you to commit every day that you will, you will pray over the things that are coming into your mind where you write them down on a list. Write out what it is that you're worried about. Is it your job? Is it your health? Is it the, the direction our country is going in? Is it, is it your finances? What is it that is worrying you? What is it that is concerning you? And then I want you to commit Every day before you, before you get started with all the busy responsibilities that you have in life, you spend just a few moments, it doesn't have to be long, and bathe your concerns in the prayers to your Heavenly Father. Cover, cover them with, with the, the, the opportunity, the privilege to come before the King of Kings and lay them down at His feet. Listen, I've come across so many people who feel like, well, that sounds great, Pastor, but listen, you don't know my past. You don't know my history. I can't pray like maybe you can, or I can't pray like some of the people in the church can. You talk about godly prayers shaping the world. Listen, my prayers are not godly. I'm, 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 I'm trying to live the life that I am called to live, but I don't feel like my prayers do anything. They, they bounce off the ceiling, and they never make it to God's ears. Listen. God tells us the prayers of the righteous person avails much. And you know what? I don't often consider myself righteous. You know why that is? Because I'm not. But thankfully, when God looks at me, He doesn't see all of my mess-ups, all my failures, and all my sins. He sees me through Jesus Christ. He sees me and all the things that I've done or all the things that I haven't done through the, eye, uh, through the lens of Christ's righteousness. That when I don't know what to pray or how to pray, or I feel like my prayers are weak, the Holy Spirit that God has given us intercedes on our behalf. Listen, you may not feel like you're very righteous and that your prayers are not very powerful, but God says differently. So I want to encourage each and every one of you. You can partner with God, shaping the world and moving it towards His kingdom when we partner with Him in prayer. So I challenge each and every one of you to begin that today. Before you go to sleep tonight, begin praying diligently, faithfully, just a few moments each day about the things that God is weighing on your heart and on your mind. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. 
you're going to have an opportunity to take that first step of obedience. You can come and pray here at the altar. You can pray in your pews. Where you pray is not important. It's just who you're praying to. So I challenge you. Go to your Heavenly Father who's waiting on the edge of His throne to hear from His son or His daughter about what's on your heart and on your mind. Let me pray with you as we go into this time of invitation. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, thank you for who you are. Lord, thank you for all that you've done. Lord, thank you for the opportunity and the blessing of being here today with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, thank you for your word that always is faithful and true. And Lord, it is timely. And Lord, I pray that we have heard from you today. Lord, I pray that your word will pierce our hearts and move us towards obedience. And Father, I pray that our prayers would be heard. Lord, that you would move as only you can in our nation. Lord, that we would seek you, not not what politicians can do, not what wealth and power can do, but Lord, we would seek what you could do through just a handful of people who are committed to praying to living the life you've called us to live. Lord, we give you this invitation. We ask that you would just use it for your kingdom and your glory. And we ask this in Christ's wonderful and holy name. Amen.